Shout out to everyone who is uh, with us this weekend, those at all of our campuses, those watching online. We are just excited for you to be a part of week six of our series, That's My King. And we're excited to jump into this. Last night I was playing uh, Would You Rather uh, with my kids. Anyone ever played that game? I was playing it with my two youngest, Miles and Presley. And uh, they're hilarious. We were going back and forth. I asked them one question. I said, would you rather have to yell all the time or whisper all the time? And I was assuming they'd say whisper. My son said, yell. And I said, really, why yell all the time? And he said, so I could become a good preacher. And (laughs) so I'm up here really self-evaluating this weekend. And I would just say, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Revelation chapter 3, right? Uh, if you're new, I, uh, I do get enthusiastic about God's word. I'm certainly enthusiastic about Christ. And uh, I pray that you just find yourself leaning into the possibility that maybe, just maybe, this Christ has more in store for you. And if you're not a Christian, oh my goodness, uh, we're just thrilled that you are here. And we pray that this is the space that you always feel welcome. And this is a space that you always feel peace and comfort in knowing that you can arrive in this setting and you can lean into the questions of life and the possibility that this Christ Uh, has great things in store for you. And I promise you, if you would surrender uh, your life fully and completely to Jesus, you would discover his ability to leave you forever changed. And uh, isn't that amazing, uh, God's ability to redeem our lives and to shape us despite our brokenness? And I I love that. And if you are new to North, you just know we're we're not a perfect church. And if we were, well, you ruined it when you showed up. And so uh, we... (laughs) recognize that uh, there's a lot of imperfection in this room and you'll find pretty quickly uh, the person giving you today's message is full of flaws and we are just individuals walking this journey together that uh, salvation gets you to heaven but sanctification gets heaven through you and it's a daily journey that takes the rest of your life in which we follow Christ and we take on the image and likeliness of Jesus and that is our prayer for every single one of us that we would just continue faithfully uh, following Christ Uh, despite where you're at, what you're going through, and the things that you're facing. And uh, we are excited about this series. We have been in this series on Revelation, which uh, really uh, provokes some really pointed conversations in, I think, a healthy way. It definitely puts some things in front of us that uh, give us some things to consider and think about when it comes to living bold and faithful lives for Christ, as well as anchoring ourselves to a vision that he places in front of us with some pretty concrete promises as to how does life play out and what is his redemptive plan going to look like when all is said and done. And what is important to understand about the book of Revelation, I think there is a tendency and definitely a desire at times to open up the book and to jump into all the gnarly stuff. Hey, I wanna talk about the mark of the beast and I wanna talk about the rapture and you know all these different wild things that you read about in uh, the book. Uh, but I do think it's important to understand that uh, the book of Revelation begins its first three chapters uh, with letters to the local church. And there are seven letters to these seven different churches that create a context and a foundation for much of the dialogue that will take place throughout the book of Revelation. And I think it's important for us to have that foundation in place. Otherwise, when it comes to things uh, referring to eschatology, which is the study of the end of times and the last days, I think sometimes we can poorly apply or misunderstand those things without understanding the critical role that the church plays in that conversation and the fact that God intended for that conversation to be facilitated and lived out among the community of believers. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so today we are going to jump back into Revelation chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and make your way there. And in this, we are looking at the church in Philadelphia. Now, not the one in Pennsylvania, but the original OG Philadelphia, which actually means Brotherly love. This is something that we hijacked as a nation. Hey, that's a great name. Let's have a city of our own called Philadelphia. And this is a city that is in the middle of the Roman Empire, like the other churches that we've talked about. They are facing pressure. They are facing persecution. Uh, But this church is doing some things well, and Christ sends a message to them uh, to encourage them. For everyone who's new uh, this weekend, to bring you up to speed, you're kind of showing up at the end of the book The uh, book of Revelation begins with John, one of the original disciples late in his age, who is now in prison and exiled, left to die on an island called Patmos. And is in that place of despair and in that place of pain 
that Christ comes to him in such a bright and illuminating way that gives him a vision of who our king is and what his desire is for every single one of us. And Christ tells John, hey, write these letters to the church. John captures the vision, tells us some pretty wonderful things with some pretty provocative imageries that just really stretch your thinking as to what does this mean and who is this Jesus? And then that vision gets applied to each church and how does that be, how is that lived out among the community of believers? And so if you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter three, it begins like this. It says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. Wave at me if you sometimes feel like you just have a little strength, right? You just don't maybe feel like you have what it takes to face what you're going through. That was the case for them. You have little strength that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. It's like a triple blessing that he's putting on them, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, come on, wave at me if you've got a pair. Whoever has ears, yeah, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so here, once again, we have a letter taking shape in the same way that all the other letters are. It begins with a salutation. Hey, these are the words of the one uh, from the original vision of Christ. And it says, these are the words of the one who is holy and the one who is true, the one who holds the key of David. And these are his words to the church in Philadelphia. What is interesting to me about these letters, if you kind of think of them in terms of a format, they all have a very consistent form to them. And the first is they all begin with an affirmation, which is wonderful. Every time, you know, Christ sends these letters through John to these churches, it begins with, you know, I, I know your deeds and I know your faithfulness and I know that you remain steadfast and I know that you have not denied my name. He says similar things in the other letters. There's always an affirmation. And what you should know when it comes to living a life with Christ, there's always an affirmation. There's always an encouraging word. There's always a stamp of God's approval upon your life in which scripture often reminds us the fact that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are a child of God, that you have been gifted and created on purpose and for a purpose. And I think a lot of times the thing that in, you know, intrigues me or at times even confuses me is the fact that there are so many Christians walking around with an unwarranted insecurity. So many insecure Christians, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we base our confidence on everything else in the words of others rather than the words of God. The words of our creator, they carry significant weight, and sometimes we are you know, basing our you know, confidence on whether or not our peers like us or whether or not they liked our social media posts, and then we fail to tune our ear to the heart of God and his words declared over our life. And if you were to develop a studious approach to scripture, you would find that over and over again, God is affirming the things uh, that you are doing right and affirms the things that you know, are great about you. And I think a person who lives anchored to scripture in faithful step with Christ is a person who develops a, an appropriate and accurate confidence. That's what I think humility is. I think humility is an accurate confidence. It's saying, hey, I know who I am and I know who I'm not and I'm content with that. And I think that is important because as we gather much of uh, our weekly worship experiences in many ways ought to be encouraging to every single person. 
In addition to the affirmation, these letters all include a correction, which is the part that none of us like. It's these, these words that, you know, address matters of the heart. They definitely, you know, do not lack clarity. And at times they make us swallow our pride. At times they make us uncomfortable. And I think a, a growing tendency within our culture is the inability to receive any type of feedback or criticism that so many people have lost that ability. And I, I think this dwarfs our de uh, development. At some point, we all need people in our life who have been given access and authority to speak into our life. And I think this, this takes some wisdom. There are some people who are making an assessment and there are some people who want to make an investment. And you have to be able to tell the difference between the two. Who are the trusted voices who get to speak into my life and get to uh, offer guidance as well as counsel and advice as I go through this deal uh, you know, called life? And, and I think with that, if, if God can't correct you, well, then who can correct you? And sometimes we, we come to scripture and it is interesting how we are so resistant to receive any form of correction from Christ. And, and folks, I would just say one of the greatest benefits of this faith is all the moments in which the Holy Spirit taps us on the shoulder and God's word really opens our eyes to the fact that he created us for more and that there's more room for improvement in every single one of us, myself included. The book of Proverbs says, wise are those who welcome a rebuke. Hey God, if, if I'm doing something wrong and if there's more potential and more room for improvement in my life, would you just make me aware of it? And would you give me the courage to say yes to those matters? Also, I can fully and completely live out your purpose in and through my life. There's an affirmation, there's a correction. And then lastly, they all end with a motivation. There's always this promise at the end to those who remain faithful, to those who conquer, to those who stay to the course, you will discover that God never lies, that he's the only person that has an unblemished track record and perfect integrity and a remarkable just credibility that when he says something, you and I can anchor our lives to those things. And there's always this motivation where God puts in front of us, hey, here is the reward for those who take me at my word. And I think what I love about this is Christ is sending these letters through John to these churches in which they would gather like we are today and someone would get up and they would read the letters to the church at large. I love that because in many ways, it's as if Jesus is saying, hey, let me plan out the service for this weekend's church service. Let me decide how it's gonna play out. And for all seven churches, he plans a service that has an affirmation, a correction, and a motivation. And I think in many ways, when we gather, our services should contain the three as well. There should always be an affirmation. There should always be a correction. And there should always be a motivation. And I think much of cultural Christianity is uh, people who love to hang out in holy places, but don't wanna become holy people. And it's learned to say, God, whatever you seek to graph into our life, uh, if you said it, so be it. I believe it. Let your will be done. And I don't know what it's like for you, but I find that uh, I am developing a bit of anxiety when it comes to uh, going through the Starbucks line and ordering for other people. <laughs> Anyone else have someone in your life who has the most complicated, sophisticated, and just drawn out you know, drink that they order at um, Starbucks. Like if someone asks me, hey, can you pick me up a drink from Starbucks? I'm always saying, well, maybe. If you drink black coffee like I do, absolutely, I got you. But if it takes a paragraph to describe your order, no. I'm, I'm nervous so much so that if my daughter and her friends are in the car, I literally just roll down the window and say, you say it. You just talk to the person directly. I don't want to do it. And I, I think sometimes... Maybe the best approach to church uh, is to make sure that man's opinion stays to the side and we just take a straight-laced view and understanding of God's word. Okay, God, you just say it. What do you have in store for us? And what would it look like for us as a community of believers to operate with a level of maturity as well as courage to say, we lean in and we receive God's word as this written, inspired, just 
relevant word that instructs and fortifies our life and what would happen if all of us sought to adhere to God's declaration over our lives, amen? There is, there's this motivation. I think it's really important for every single one of us to really approach God's word with the mindset that we are not trying to conform God's word to our lives. Instead, we're trying to conform our lives to God's word. And this marks the life of a true believer, someone who adheres fully and completely and understands he is King Jesus, he is Lord of all, and he has full authority and we all are accountable to him, amen? It's an amazing thing. I think we live in times where the conversations are getting tricky and this is even bubbling up within the community of faith and is learning how do we look to scripture and develop handles of discernment also that we can navigate the life that we're living. And there is in this passage an emphasis on God's authority, that he is holy, that he is true, and that he holds the key of David. And whatever door he opens, no one can close. And whatever door he closes, no one can open. It's a, it's a great way of saying he's God and he's in charge. And sometimes we all need to be reminded of that. He's God and he's in charge. And there is a bit of, I think, resistance uh, to receiving God and acknowledging his authority that is growing within our culture. We, we live in times where there is uh, such a spirit of suspicion towards anything that reflects authority. So we, we don't trust politicians and we don't trust police officers and we don't trust the education system and we don't trust pastors, right? We have suspicion towards anyone in an authority role. And then what we're starting to do is this snowball effect has created so much momentum that now we're projecting suspicion onto God's authority. And there is an entire movement or train of thought that wants to adhere to a life with Christ while dismissing his lordship. And the fact that he is the king of kings and he has full authority. In this passage, there's a word called curios, which sounds like our word curious, and this refers to God's authority. In fact, through the book of Revelation, you find this word 20 times. More than that, in the New Testament, you find this word 687 times. So for the person, and I recently heard a conversation where someone was like, you know, the church is always overdoing the authority conversation when it comes to God. And I always ask the question, well, maybe that's true. Let's, let's consider what scripture says. Does scripture overdo the authority conversation? Does scripture place an emphasis on God's lordship? And there's no question all throughout the New Testament, it's he's Lord, he's Lord, he's Lord. And what we are bumping into is a tendency uh, to uh, adhere to the attributes of God that we like and then dismiss the ones that we're uncomfortable with. We are in times where what is often placed in front of us is what would be referred to as choice architecture. Have you ever heard this phrase? Wave at me if you've ever heard the phrase choice architecture. This is much of what is driving some of the stuff in our world. Choice architecture is a way of presenting decisions uh, in a manipulative way that push a group of people towards a desired outcome. It's choice architecture and it's, it's all over our, our culture and it's in the press and media and we're bumping into it every single day. And this is much of what is driving so much of the division and the polarization in our culture. We're constantly faced with two options and we never really feel like they're great options, but we have to choose one or the other. I, I know this is kind of probably put me on an island and I pray that you give me a little bit of grace. I would like to maybe share with you some real popular examples of this that you bump into every single week, that I bump into, that we see around the world. It's like, hey, this would be primary examples of choice architecture being placed in front of us. I remember it being in Minneapolis during 2020 and you know, George Floyd was murdered and it was a terrible situation and it just created a lot of conversation around race. And much of the influence was being attached to the organization Black Lives Matter. And one of the things you were to hear during that season is, do you support the organization Black Lives Matter or do you support white supremacy? That's choice architecture. 
Or, or maybe another form of choice architecture is, are you pro-choice or are you against women having rights? Well, that's choice architecture. Or another one would say, are you affirming or do you practice hate? And so for the person trying to navigate some of this stuff, it's like, well, I don't support white supremacy. I don't practice hate. And I'm certainly not against women having rights. What are my options? And this is what is at times driving and forcing and persuading a lot of people in their logic. Folks, here's what we have to understand, that if we don't learn to resist the world's categories, we are going to continue to arrive at the world's conclusions. If we don't learn to say, no, like those aren't the only two options and that's not the only way to approach this conversation. It's super misleading and it's super unproductive and it's harmful to a lot of people. And so you have to learn, hey, this is constantly the primer that is being put in front of us and trying to gauge the way in which we think. And, and I pray you maybe hear my heart on, on where I'm going with that. But this is certainly uh, something that is bubbling up in the church and you're, you're seeing it when it comes to how we view Jesus. A lot of people love the fact that he's loving. They love the fact that he's a good shepherd and they certainly love the fact that he's a great friend. Isn't it amazing that you can have friendship with God? But there's now this, this way of thinking, and I'm seeing it all over the place, that assumes that you have to choose between the friendship of Christ or the lordship of Christ. Which one is it? And folks, we need to be very careful that we don't start to delineate and dismiss parts of God uh, that are true to his nature and character. This will always be a temptation. This will always be a tendency within the community of believers. This is why John in his gospel, John chapter one, he begins and he says, Christ was full of grace and truth. It wasn't one or the other. And so we as believers, we, we sit in the tension and we learn to, hey, how do we have deeper dialogue and learn to reason better? And how do we move things forward in a way that is edifying and respects the dignity of all people and encourages and serves one another in a way that adds value? We don't have to take our cues from culture. Does that make sense? And to dismiss the Lordship of Christ, I think is a terrible miss. One theologian about Kyrios, he said this. He said, the Greek word Kyrios can mean the teacher who has authority over disciples, the master who has command over servants, or the Lord who has power over all. With Jesus, all three meanings apply. And folks, at the end of the day, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And whether you are a Christian or not, this is what I personally believe, and you shouldn't be surprised to hear this in the church that adheres to the Bible. At some point, every single one of us meet our maker and we're all accountable to him. And it's learning to see that as a good thing. Wait a second, the only uniquely set apart, holy and righteous source of truth, the only person who will never leave me nor forsake me, the one who has done the unthinkable on behalf of me, he's in charge? That's great news. For a world that is so suspicious of its leaders, I'm glad we have a God like this who's in charge, amen? And it is learning to appreciate the Lordship of Christ. A lot of Christians love Jesus as Savior, but a lot of Christians are shrugging him as Lord. Folks, he's Lord. And anyone who predicts his own death and resurrection and then pulls it off stands in the league of his own. And so we look to him for our guidance and our covering, and we recognize that in the end, he's fully in control. He is sovereign, amen? And he says he is, he's holy. That word means he's, he's unique, he's set apart. He's fully and completely perfectly righteous, and he's true. And I love that we have a God who will never lie to us. In a world full of lies, it's great to have a God who is so anchored in truth. And so I think it is learning to develop a greater posture and understanding as to how do we think about some of this stuff so we don't get tripped up and fall into uh, some nonsense that could at times create a drift in our relationship with God. He says he's holy, he's true, 
and he holds the key of David. Now, if you go to Isaiah chapter 22 this week, I don't have time to go there today. But if you go there, what you'll find is in Isaiah chapter 22, there's a guy by the name of Elimelech, which is a great name if you're pregnant and you haven't found a name yet. <laughs> and he is what is known as a steward. And the steward basically held the keys to the kingdom. The steward was the gatekeeper. They decided what gets to pass through the door to the king, what gets access to the king, who gets access to the king, and who doesn't. They were the gatekeeper. And this uh, passage in Revelation is saying, yeah, Christ is the ultimate gatekeeper, that he has defeated death, hell, and the grave, that he holds the keys to the kingdom, and he now has swung wide open some doors for you and I to take full advantage of, as well as slam some doors shut. And anyone thankful for some closed doors? I think one of the best things you can pray for is, God, would you open doors of your will and would you close the doors of distraction in my life? God, whatever is just a distraction, blind me to those things and slam those doors completely shut. He holds these keys. And this idea of an open door is actually all throughout the New Testament. Paul would reference an open door all the time. And in referencing the open door, what was he often referring to? He's often referring to a ministry assignment, a ministry opportunity. And I think sometimes we as believers are going through life uh, failing to look for all the ministry opportunities and ways in which God wants us to participate in his work within the world. It makes me think of Max Lucado, who is a wonderful author. And at one point in a book, he was writing about a fishing trip that he had gone on with his dad and his brothers and his cousins, uncles, I think were on the trip. He said, we get out there on the fishing trip, we go get into the boat and immediately it starts to rain. So we have to you know, dock the boat and we have to go hang out in the camper where it proceeded to rain for like the next three days. He said, so we didn't get to do any fishing. Instead, we just sat in the camper and eventually we just started bickering and fighting. And he said, the moment we stopped fishing, we started fighting. I love that statement. The moment we stopped fishing, we started fighting. And folks, if you are a follower of Christ, similar to Peter's journey, where Christ says, hey, I will make you a fisher of men, that you and I are to live on mission, sharing the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ with anyone and everyone, the moment we stop fishing is the moment we start fighting. And you can take a tour throughout our country and visit a number of churches where the moment any of us turn inward and lose our, our desire to reach people who don't know Jesus, suddenly we become unproductive and at odds with one another, arguing over nonsense within the local church. And it's just learning to say, hey, how do we, how do we as believers stay white hot on mission also that the world who's yet to meet Christ can discover the goodness of who he is. Folks, there is an incredible ministry opportunity in front of us. Now, the, the open door idea, it's twofold. First, the open door is the door of salvation. So for all of you today who you're not a Christian, again, we're, we're thrilled that you're here. The, the first step for you is to walk through the door of salvation to recognize, hey, this Christ did for me what no one else could or would. Isn't that amazing? that this Christ leans in despite our brokenness and despite our mess, that he's so different than any other person in your life. It's like the old statement that says, if you wanna discover who your true friends are, make a mistake and see who runs and see who leans in. And our God always, he always leans in. And so it is learning maybe for the first time to say, hey, I'm stepping in to this relationship with Christ. I am fully and completely surrendering my life to Jesus. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I made the statement. I said, hey, would you consider being a Christian? Not just today, not this week, not just this month, but for the rest of your life. And an individual came up to me and said, man, I was with you until you said for the rest of our lives. That gave me pause. And I thought to myself, well, that's good then. I would rather you have pause than to, to make an impulsive decision that you've not seriously considered. Am I truly committed to following Christ? And am I gonna live a life in relationship with him anchored to his word? That's what it means to be a Christian and a disciple of Jesus. And he says, there's this door that is swung wide open. 
And the, the other one is this, this ministry opportunity, that there's a great opportunity that stands in front of you and I. I shared this about a year ago, but based on population, America is the third largest mission field in the world. Based on population, only China and India have more non-Christians living in their nation than America. That's kind of crazy to think about. What that says is, you know, for the, you know, greater than any other point in our nation's history is a missional opportunity for you and I to go out into our communities and into our companies and into our schools and wherever God takes us and to be a representation of Christ that reaches people who have yet to know Jesus. And I think a great question, you know, maybe to always ask when you're reading scripture is what is the courageous question? I think when you read the Bible, you have to ask questions. And I would always encourage you, consider what would be the courageous question? When you hear that there is a door of opportunity with a ministry assignment to reach people who do not know Jesus, what would a courageous question be? And here's maybe one to consider. When was the last time you personally led someone to Jesus? That's a courageous question. This is not to you know, create some church growth strategy where, hey, we're trying to build our attendance at North, you know, that's nonsense. Um, but what it is to say is to, we want to live on mission, taking as many people with us, you know, to heaven in which we are a part of making heaven crowded. I don't know about you, but I want heaven to be crowded. I, I want heaven to just be full of people from every tribe and nation, every background, every generation represented in heaven. And in my position, I get to hear a lot of fun feedback on what people think of large churches. And a lot of people will let me know at times, I just can't stand big churches. And I'm like, I get that, but just know, heaven is gonna be hell to you. Because uh, <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of us uh, in there worshiping Christ. And I, I think what an opportunity for you and I to live on mission for the glory of God. This is, this is a wonderful thing. You know, he talks about this idea that, that you will be a pillar in the temple. What, what he's saying about that is he is placing before them the promise of eternity. He's placing before them the promise of eternal life that, hey, yes, life is challenging. Life comes with pain, but we are here today and gone tomorrow. Life is but a vapor, scripture would say. But every single one of us, we all live forever somewhere. And it's what you make of Jesus that is the most important decision of your life. That is the deciding factor, Scripture would say. And that's what I personally believe is the most important thing about any one of us is what do you make of Jesus? And, you know, Philadelphia was a missionary city, not in the way we think of missionaries. It was a missionary city commissioned by the Roman Empire. It was a city that was uh, strategically placed uh, to advance the Greek language and Greek philosophy. Strategically, it was, you know, supposed to carry out influence uh, of, throughout the region. And Christ comes to this group of people living in a missionary city that is strategically being developed for influence. And he's saying, yeah, I'm going to embed a church in the middle of that activity that is going to carry forward the influence of the gospel around the world. Uh, much of what we experience and know and adhere to as believers uh, is shaped by individuals who carried out the gospel in spaces like Philadelphia that said, hey, we're going to reach people in this context. What I love about Philadelphia is, like all the other churches that we've been talking about in this series, they're facing pressure. They're facing persecution. They are under the governance of a wicked and maniacal Roman empire. Yet somehow, they're living a faithful life. And, and folks, especially young people, you can live a faithful life in a wicked world. You can live a life that honors God in a wicked world. You can stand in values and in truth in a world full of lies, in a world full of despair, and in a world full of evil. You can do this. That's a wonderful thing. Christ sees it in you and is learning to take him at his word. Okay, I can, I can do this. You know, Philadelphia was built on the edge of a volcano. And much of this was advantageous to their agriculture, that the soil was uh, more, 
you know, potent or whatever they would say. And so they built this community right there on the side of the, the volcano. But what that meant is it constantly came with earthquakes and tremors. And so the people who lived in Philadelphia were always living on edge, always unsure and uncertain about their circumstances and always ready to run at the first sign of crisis. And he comes to people who are living in a place that lacks stability, living in a place that comes with constant inconvenience and constant uncertainty. And he says, I will make you a pillar. I will graft within you a stability that you can't even think or imagine and you don't even know to pray for. And it won't just carry you through this life, but it will carry you through eternal life where you will stand resolute and immovable, secure and stable in Christ. That's a wonderful promise. And this is what he's writing to the church in Philadelphia. Hey, would you stay faithful? Would you remain to the course and would you not give up? There's an incredible opportunity in front of you. And one thing that I think is pretty comical if you go to the pages of scripture is it is hard to find an appealing opportunity. Divine opportunities are rarely appealing. You look at Moses' situation, Abraham's situation, Noah's situation, Jonah, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. None of those people lived situations and were called to do things that you look at and think, now that sounds amazing. Guys, he called Abraham and Sarah to be homeless late in their age. He called Noah, who had never even experienced rain, let alone a large body of water, had never seen a flotation device. And he says, I'm sending a flood and you need to build an ark. Here's the blueprints. And I need you to get a bunch of animals on the inside. Folks, that sounds like a nightmare to me. I've got one pet and I'm learning to love that pet. To be in a boat with a bunch of animals? No, thank you. That sounds like a terrible opportunity. And divine opportunities, they're rarely appealing opportunities. Initially, we can find a lot of things wrong with them, can't we? And I think when it comes to the, the charge to, to reach people for Christ, to live on mission, emboldened by the Holy Spirit, to advance the gospel, we can look at our world and our current circumstances and think there's so many things standing in contradiction to the things that we believe and what God is calling us to. And I think it's rising up in faith and saying, okay, God, whatever you have in store for my life, let it be. I'm saying yes to your command. And I'm gonna step outside my comfort zone also I can experience your work in my life and through my life, amen? That's a wonderful thing. I love the, the conversations always about pessimism and optimism. There's always the half uh, the glass that's half full or half empty. And I think the, the conversation about the glass being half empty and half full, uh, the difference is not in the content. The, the difference is in the consequence. Choosing to live with a pessimistic mindset, I think does come with greater challenges than an optimistic mindset. But I once read this, this cartoon is like a comic strip and it had a glass sitting on a kitchen counter and the glass was empty. And the pessimist and the optimist come walking in the room and there's a note next to the glass. And it says, while the two of you were arguing about whether or not the glass was half full or half empty, I went ahead and drank it. Sincerely, the opportunist. I think that's great. The pessimist, the optimist, and the opportunist. And I just think maybe we could you know, take our cues from something like that. Hey. Is there anything that we're doing where we're missing the point where we need to get back to just seizing the opportunity to reach people who do not know Jesus? And again, the courageous question for all of us, who was the last person in your life that you led to Christ, that you shared your faith with? It's something that causes every single one of us to consider, am I daily living on mission, looking for opportunities to introduce people to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who's truly set apart Jesus Christ and Christ alone. That's a wonderful thing. It makes me, you know, just think of all the opportunities that we see every single day, we hear every single day, yet we, we don't tune an ear to it and we miss the opportunity to share Christ with people. With, with my kids, I, I turn it into a game. I'm like, listen, you, you can talk about Jesus all the time. 
Someone says they have a bad day. You know who else had a bad day? Jesus had a bad day. Someone else starts complaining about their stepdad. You know who else had a stepdad? Jesus had a stepdad. Some of you don't realize that. Joseph was the first, right? And there's things that you can do to bring Christ up. And I'm just telling you, the people in your life are cracking the door for you to share your faith more than you realize. There's that statement, when opportunity knocks. Folks, when it comes to the opportunity to share Jesus with people, it's not a knock. It's ringing the doorbell, leaning on the doorbell. It's always available to us. And I end with this. I was recently listening to this podcast and uh, you know, I think it's always important to know, guys, I, I do listen and read a lot of unfriendly sources. I'm always nervous when people look at my bookshelf because they would probably be frustrated or offended by some of the things that I read. But these are the conversations taking place within our culture. And I was listening to this podcast. There's two individuals who pride themselves on being atheist, and they were railing on Christianity and the church. And at one point, the one host asked the other host, he says, hey, why do you dislike Christians so much? It's a great question. Why do you dislike Christians so much? And the guy's immediate response was, because I know so many of them. And he said, well, unpack that. And he said, what I mean by that is, I know so many Christians who truly believe that Jesus Christ is the way the truth and the life and the only source of our salvation, that he is the deciding factor on you and I having eternal life with God. He says, I know so many people who believe that, yet they've never shared Christ with me once. And then he made this statement. He said, if what they believe is true, how cruel is it that they never share that with me? And I just remember thinking, wow, that's such an interesting perspective from someone who stands in contrast to our beliefs, that they look at what we say we believe and think, well, if that's true, why are you being so stingy with such good news? And I think, again, as believers, the courageous question is, all right, God, who in my life, who in my life do you want me to be a reflection of you? And how can I best represent you in a world and in the culture and in the context where people desperately need to know of Jesus. And I, I just pray that we all find the motivation to live on mission for Christ as if eternity really does still hang in the balance for a lot of people. And to consider, is there any type of bizarre cruelty in our in inability or unwillingness to share Jesus with people who've yet to meet him? What would it look like? If all of us began to pray, God, would, would you break our heart for the thing that breaks your heart? Also that we can bring more and more people into a saving knowledge of Christ. Amen.